Well, first of all, we, we have to realize that we have been, so far, been using energy sources which are highly polluting and disease-inducing. Uh, uh, just looking at the burning of uh, hydrocarbons or fossil fuels, uh, the number of deaths uh, due to uh, pollution alone, air pollution, setting aside the debate on climate change, global warming, the droughts that are happening now, the floods, the, the hurricanes, the uh, deforestation, all of these all interact and create this vicious uh, stew of pollution, of cases of emphysema coming from uh, the uh, polluted air and the acid rain from the burning of coal, uh, the, uh, the problems with nuclear power, uh, huge problems. Uh, we, we remember Chernobyl and all of the deaths uh, that came as a result of radiation poisoning. Uh, there's hardly any energy source we use now that's not polluting. And I have to uh, say that I include biofuels um, and uh, even wind and solar to a degree, although to a lesser degree. Biofuels, of course, uh, uh, compete with agriculture. And uh, if one SUV full of a biofuel could feed one hungry person for one year. So the starvation on the planet is going up on account of the fact that people are now being uh, starting to use some of the huge agro industries such as Monsanto are beginning to now create um, biofuels which would then uh, uh, be uh, otherwise used for, for food and to develop the infrastructure for that actually by some calculations use more hydrocarbons than you get out of uh, the energy you get out of the biofuel and so when you look at the alternatives one by one even solar and wind uh, solar and wind are, uh, are, are very useful once installed, but they're very capital intensive. They are very materials intensive. They're land intensive. They use a lot of land. They're intermittent and dis diffuse. And so uh, if, if you look at, for example, the investment required to replace today's energy sources with a wind or solar economy, you're getting into the tens of trillions of dollars and into mining even more metals uh, that would have to be used and other materials, silicon for the solar collectors, even thin films. No matter what way you go using the old 19th and 20th century technologies, it's not going to do it. But meanwhile, and ever since the time of Nikola Tesla and even before then, there exist waiting in the wings for their opportunity clean, cheap, safe, decentralized energy sources such as cold fusion, uh, the so-called zero-point energy or energy from the vacuum, um, and uh, various innovative hydrogen and water chemistries that allow the possibility of, of actually creating energy out of water or out of hydrogen uh, that's greater than um, than, than measured by the energy going in, by measured by traditional means. In other words, let's take the, the so-called hydrogen economy. Using traditional means, it, it costs more energy to electrolyze the water to get the hydrogen than you get out of the hydrogen. So it's a no-win proposition. The existing alternatives are no-win. But if you use some of these new technologies um, and there have been many proofs of concept in the laboratory of the cold fusion concept basically that's the ability to fuse hydrogen atoms in a uh, solution of water at room temperature that's uh, catalyzed by palladium and other materials to allow the atoms to fuse and then create more energy uh, than, than you, you had to put into it into the first place. So you have all of these different concepts that are, that, are, that are out there that have been proven beyond any reasonable doubt that they exist, but at the same time they've also been suppressed. So the message in my book, The Energy Solution Revolution, is that we, we have now an opportunity, as never before, to uh, first of all debate whether is this what we want in our future because you see if we do if we're open to the possibility that these energy sources are can be viably implemented and I believe they can I've gone to laboratories all over the world 
visited some of the brightest and best inventors and there's no question in my mind that the concepts are very real. They're even becoming theoretically understood. It's sort of like the Wright brothers have already flown on this one, but they're not delivering passengers or mail yet. They haven't, uh, because it's been historically true, it's the nature of scientific revolutions. Uh, there have been some really good books written about this, uh, scholarly books about that whenever there's a new concept that comes along that's revolutionary, um, the culture resists it. And the culture resists it, first of all, because the scientists uh, that pin their entire star on existing paradigms, uh, they don't want it to come along because it makes them look silly for naysaying the possibility of this. Uh, the environmentalists are more more into negotiating with corporations or going for half answers which are embedded in the mainstream of the culture. The so-called progressives are really good at criticizing our current government policy but don't know squat about the possibilities of breakthrough energy. So you have all of these different groups opposed. Um, you know, Orwell one time said that the greatest lies are lies of omission. And right now the culture just doesn't accept it, whether it's the media, whether it's uh, the progressive critics, the government, or certainly large corporations. They don't want it because it would cut into their profits. Um, I envision someday being able to fit in the palm of my hand uh, a power pack, um, a solid state device that uh, where the electrons within it would resonate with the hypothesized vast energy field of the vacuum and being able to take let's say 10 kilowatts out of that and to put it in your circuit breaker box or in, under the hood of your car. These are the kinds of things that could happen rather rapidly once there's societal acceptance of this. However, up until now, what's been going on is that the big boys, call it the CIA, the uh, conspirators, the New World Order, they all want to um, suppress it. And that's, of course, the real problem. Many uh, of the inventors and researchers uh, have been murdered, they've been threatened, they've had their funding cut off, the patent office won't allow any patents in this. And so then we get to the possibility of open sourcing this, that it seems like at this point in time uh, the, the whole concept of breakthrough clean energy I think needs to be developed out of a sense of altruism. Because if we don't do this, from my point of view, I think it's absolutely necessary for our survival. If we're going to have a future Earth uh, that's sustainable and abundant, we're going to have to develop this. But on the other side of the coin is that it could be abused. It, uh, it, it, uh, some uh, people might want to develop it for personal helicopters or bigger power saws. Uh, so we have to be very, very careful. We have to be socially responsible for developing this like any other technology. And it seems like uh, besides the military industrial complex and the fighting of wars, uh, the big area of focus now is energy. How do we use our energy? And what we're talking about here is supplanting a four trillion dollar per year energy economy. And if you take Bertrand Russell's words, the resistance to, to a new idea increases as the square of its importance. You're talking about a huge, huge uh, change in our culture. And no vested interest wants that to happen. And so it's really incumbent on us, those of us that are willing to think outside the box, to support even the notion or the possibility that we could have a, a free energy future.